Cleanliness is next to godliness. God loves me and wants to save me. We're all God's children. Unatoned for sin will cost you an eternity in hell. Can you tell which one of these is based on good theology? If not, you've come to the right place. Hi, I'm James and welcome to the channel. Today we're going to begin to talk about theology. Now hang on, I understand. Some of us might think theology, it's just way too hard. I can't understand it. Or maybe you think theology isn't really that important. I mean, I believe in God, that's enough, right? Or only pastors and teachers should worry about theology. Truth is, we all do theology. Even those that don't believe in God have done some form of theology. So what is theology? Theology is basically what the whole Bible teaches on a particular topic. And what we do is we take theology and we build a doctrine. So what is a doctrine? So a doctrine is a truth from Scripture that we use and apply to our lives to help us live or conduct ourselves in a certain way. I'll explain it like this. So theology is like this. You first start off with a single brick. And as you continue to build on your theology, you begin to form what is called doctrines. So what is the purpose for theology? Well, it's to help us know the truths of Scripture and helps us apply them to our lives. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 15 says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the faithfulness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is ahead, even Christ. Okay, so why do we need it? Second Timothy 4, 1 through 5 says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, whom is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So, Understanding those, what we're going to do is we're going to work through systematic theology. Now, what does that big word mean? Basically, it's a system of working through theology that covers all the basic major topics in Scripture. So this way, when someone makes a statement like that, we're all God's children, we'll know whether it's true or false. Because at the end of the day, we want to understand truth. Now, understand... When we begin to cover theology, this begins to hit on some of the core beliefs that you and I may have, whether, you know, grandmommy taught us or whether it's just what we picked up throughout our lives or whether we heard Joe the plumber say it or however we come to get these truths implanted inside of us. They may be challenged during this period. Now understand this also. Just because I say it, or just because you hear someone else say it, don't take that as a matter of fact. If you can't be taken to God's Word and shown that this is actually what God's Word says, you need to go ahead and cast that out and not believe it is truth. So, where do we begin? So, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to begin on our major doctrines. And these are going to be our major doctrines. The doctrine of the Word of God. The doctrine of of God, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of Christ and the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the application of redemption, the doctrine of the church, and the doctrine of the future. Now that's a lot. We're not going to cover all these in one lesson. This is going to take many, many, many episodes for us to do this. Feel free to skip around if you decide that you want to learn something else other than the one I've put out. So these are the basic major doctrines that we're going to cover in these lessons. 
So where do we begin to do systematic theology? So we first must start with two assumptions. So the first, the Bible is truth and it alone is the authority for all truth. And second, the God of the Bible is the only true God and he is who he said he is. So when we begin with those two, we can begin to start our systematic theology. Now, you might be saying, why would I make these two assumptions? Well, everybody that does any type of learning starts with some type of an authority. Whether it's a textbook or whether it's an expert in the field, we all start with a source of our truth, where we begin to learn what it is that we're trying to learn. And if you're wanting to learn biblical theology, these are the two assumptions that we're going to have to make to begin this process. So maybe you don't buy both of these assumptions, but I think by the time we begin to progress through this systematic theology, you will. So why should we do systematic theology is probably what you're asking me now. And that's a great question. Well, the first thing it does is it equips us to not only teach others, but to teach ourselves what the truth of God's word is. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Second, it's to know truth. Don't we all want to know truth? We live in a day and age where everybody's got their own truth. But the truth of the matter is not everybody can be true. There's one truth and then everything else falls outside of that, regardless of how many people want to try to tell you truth is relative. Because if truth is relative, is that true? Well, if that's a truth, that just broke that, that rule. John 8, 31 through 32. Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So in knowing truth, it also begins to correct the errors that we're thinking. So as we begin to think errors, it begins to correct those errors and put us back on track. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It also helps us to recognize the lies and make better decisions. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. And this is one of the best ways to begin to grow into maturity as a Christian believer. 2 Peter 3.14-18 says, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just also as a beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do all the rest of scriptures, to their own destruction, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So we've come to this point and you might be asking, okay, well, how do I study systematic theology? Another great question. Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to begin to study prayerfully. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. And for this reason, Psalm 119.18 says, Open my eyes, that I may behold wonderful things from thy law. Second thing we need to do is we need to begin to study humbly. No one can learn who already knows everything. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves in humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Third, we must begin to study with logic and reason. Now, I know some things are hard to understand, and I know there are certain miracles that aren't quite logical in a sense, but as we study through systematic theology, we begin to understand that logic and reason play a big role 
in making all this make sense. If these two ideas don't fit together very logically, or there's no reason to connect these two ideas together, then they probably don't fit, or one of them is wrong, or both. Fourth, we begin to study with help from others. There are a lot of people out there that have been studying a whole lot of years to understand a lot of this stuff, to help us to understand a lot of this stuff. Look what this says. God never intended us to grow alone. This is why in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, he wrote, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the faithfulness of Christ. Fifth, we need to begin to study it completely. Now, I know that we begin to hit some topics that are not culturally correct today, that are politically incorrect today, that are very difficult to hear. But the problem is, is we can't pick and choose what is truth and what isn't truth. So we need to study the whole thing completely. And as we do that, and we begin to understand what the truth really is, we need to begin to allow that to shape the way we think and the way we believe on the inside. And six, we need to do it with rejoicing and praising. We have the ability to begin to understand the mind of God, to begin to understand the truths about life and death and sin and hope and the future that we all desire. Don't we all want to know who we are and why we're here and what our purpose is and what is after this life and is there life after death and if so, what does it look like? Well, this is where we begin to understand that. And hopefully it begins to allow you to rejoice. So I'd like you to answer this question down in the comments. So what was your attitude towards systematic theology before you came here? And what is your attitude now after watching this video? Has it changed at all? Is it pretty much still the same? Have you become eager to begin to understand what the whole Bible says about a particular topic? If so, I hope you come and join me next time as we begin to study the Word of God. Is the Word of God true? Is it reliable? Is it all we need in order to live this life? Tune in next time and find out.